Hi, everybody. Uh, those of you who are joining in the call, thanks so much. I'm David Ezer, Vice President of Programs with Jewish Funders Network, and thanks so much for coming together today for today's program called Next Year We Hope in Jerusalem. So we can take a look at how the how the Israel experience field has responded to COVID and what is ahead in this uh, field that is as beset by uncertainty and challenge as any in the wake of the the, the pandemic. So with us today, uh, we have Ariella Saperstein, uh, the program officer at Maimonides Fund, we who will be moderating our conversation um, for the sort of a, a which will consist of a, a presentation from Rena Goldberg, Managing Director for Israel and Overseas with JFNA. We'll make a presentation on some of the, the data and work that they've been leading around, around the table with a number of funders and practitioners. Uh, and our other members and, and colleagues here, Stephen Green, Senior Director of Grants Management and Compliance with the Jim Joseph Foundation out of San Francisco, Liz Sikalski, the Executive Director of Birthright Israel North America, and Mike Wise, the co-CEO of the Honeymoon Israel Foundation. Uh, I, pro I imagine that everybody in the call really knows about JFN, but just in case the, the 10 second version, we are of course a membership organization for independent and private Jewish uh, fam uh, foundations and, and donors. And we help extend the, the reach and connection and impact of their philanthropy through a variety of programs and membership uh, elements and programs, which you can look more, learn more about on our website. Uh, that said, I'm happy to get this started. I just want to note that if anybody has questions or would like to, to raise, a, raise a point with the panelists, please go ahead and use the Q&A tool uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And we will have a couple points during the program where we can get to that uh, and more at the end, of course. So hang on, stay patient. And with that said, I'm happy to introduce Ariella. Great, thanks David. Hi everybody, excited to be on this call and thanks everybody for joining and taking this time. We have a lot of ground to cover. I, I'm sure there are some people on the, on the call who are very closely working um, in the field of Israel travel and there may be others who are sort of uh, following along more from a distance. So we're gonna try to cover um, multiple aspects of this as well as the implications I think for Israel education. Um, just to give the quick overview, I think as most people know, um, travel to Israel has essentially been on hold since the beginning of the pandemic, um, with many, many trips that were scheduled for this summer obviously canceled. And it looks like the outlook um, for the next few months is uncertain, um, to say the least. And uh, it may well be the case that Israel travel does not resume until 2021. So, um, so some of the things that we want to explore are sort of implications for um, for folks who are meant to be traveling to Israel this year and cannot, and also how we can ensure that the infrastructure that we've um, put a lot of resources into in the last several months, um, several years, has uh, remained strong enough that when travel can resume, um, it can resume. Uh, at a strong at a strong level. Um, there have been a lot of organizations created just in the last 10 to 15 years that have been doing increasingly specialized educational trips for both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. Um, and many of those organizations um, are now getting together um, in sort of, I think, an unprecedented way to share information, to collaborate, and to communicate um, both with each other and with some of the major funders in that field. Um, they are now going by the moniker of the Israel Travel Alliance. So um, Rena is going to give a little bit of background on that. And just to give a quick overview of the agenda, Rena will um, share a little bit about the ITA and its members and sort of the scope of the Israel Travel field right now. Um, and then we're going to open it up just very briefly for um, any questions or clarifications on Rena's presentation. And then Mike, Liz, and Stephen will give some brief opening remarks. I will ask them a few questions to delve into some of the relevant issues. And then we're going to open it up in the last 15 or 20 minutes or so to your questions. But feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function over the course of the webinar. And I will keep an eye on them and also try to intersperse uh, perhaps some of them in the discussion so we can get to as many of them as possible. So with that, let's hand it over to Rena. Thanks so much, Ariella. Uh, thanks to JFN for hosting this. Erev Tov from Jerusalem. Um, 
I'm going to tell you the story of the Israel Travel Alliance, which actually started um, in the early days of the um, pandemic um, with, um, you know, as these things often do sort of naturally um, of folks getting together and saying, um, how can we coordinate? How can we share best practices? How can we share services? Um, and I think from there, it sort of, it grew, you know, with thanks to Mike Wise and Ben Perry from Momentum and Birthright, it sort of grew. Um, at the same time, other organizations in different subsectors of the Israel Travel um, um, sec you know, universe were also getting together um, and sort of organically came to JFNA and said, could you convene us um, in a, sing a single umbrella so that we can um, uh, we can all be together? Um, and this was really organic for Jewish Federations of North America. Um, while you are familiar with one or all of these organizations through your, your funding, um, you may be less aware that federations support nearly every one of these um, organizations as well, either individually, collectively. Um, and that's because federations are invested in Israel engagement, connecting North American Jewry with Israel and Israel and we know how effective these trips are to deepening those connections and of course there's a significant overlap uh, with um, one of the Federation's uh, historic partners the Jewish Agency for Israel and that's where the Israel Travel Alliance came into being um, now a coalition of about 37 organizations and you can see them listed here um, not included on this list but critical to what and what um, Ariella said uh, part of the ITA also includes funders, um, and that was from the start a imperative to have folks around the table, being transparent, direct open communications, um, and that's something that um, I think the organizations and we JFNA have enjoyed as well, that ongoing conversation. So the data that I'm going to be sharing with you really um, was, was drawn from a survey that we did um, of these organizations. These are the ones that have responded to the survey. There are a couple more in the ITA sort of as participants, the distribution of this this point is an email list of over 100 names. Um, so it's really a robust group. And we're talking about, as I said, 37 organizations, but nearly 50 programs, because some of the organizations have different uh, length uh, of programs or audiences, teens, young adults, college, et cetera. We're talking varying program lengths from short term, which is up to three weeks, mid, which is one to four months, and then, of course, the long term programs, which is four months or more. These programs represent upwards of 80,000 and um, 80,000 participants each year. Um, and of course, we're talking about multi-faith audiences. Well, predominantly, it's aimed, the target populations are Jewish. Um, there are uh, several organizations within the Alliance which work specifically with non-Jewish audiences or explicitly with interfaith audiences. And the organizations, again, really range from small to large, right? employing overall the sector, nearly 700 staff in Israel, uh, North America, and across the world. The budgets of these organizations range anywhere from half a million dollars to upwards of $50 million. We've learned about the participants somewhat from the survey as well, right? 75% of all of the participants are under the age of 30, really a core um, you know, audience, specifically from the North American Jewish perspective. 99% um, of participants engage with Israelis in some way, in some manner on their, on their um, programs, which is critical, again, going back to this connection of the goals of Israel engagement and, and deepening the relationships. And the majority of the programs are also coming for uh, shorter programs, three weeks or less, which, um, which is, presents a particular problem or challenge uh, these days during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, so what have we learned? Kind of thus far from the survey about a typical year, these organizations may have a single trip of 23 people coming over the course of a year, while some organizations, like my friend and colleagues Liz Sikulski's Birthright Israel, of course we're talking 200 groups, 45,000 participants um, in each year, um, but the average of the programs represented in the ITA basically are bringing about 2,800 or so participants uh, each year uh, to Israel. So what has the impact been um, on participant numbers based on the survey? So between uh, March and, and anticipating to the end of the summer, uh, it's close to 50,000 participants have not traveled to Israel. Um, and we're estimating uh, that in nearly 40,000 will not travel um, from September through March. So I'm just going to let those numbers sink in, right? That's the, I think, in a lot of ways, gets to the heart of what we're talking about. All of those individuals who are not having this transformative experience. Um, the survey also sought to get to the financial health of the sector. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing 52% of the organizations 
um, are expect that they're um, are in, are having a budget shortfall. Um, Thirty six percent. Um, had staff cuts or furloughs, and 47% reported that they're anticipating their philanthropic uh, contributions to decrease. Um, so while we're talking about philanthropy and APT, obviously, for this audience, you know, we asked the programs um, what they're hearing from their funding partners. And I pulled a couple of quotes that I thought were just, um, you know, indicative of the, the, the majority of the quotes in terms of the amazing support and flexibility that the funding community has shown. Um, the, the kind of the belief in the mission and the commitment of, 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 of supporting the organizations in this tough time, um, and sort of an anticipation of where perhaps the community is thinking of going forward. Uh, we also asked how, how the programs thought funders can best support them, right? And so here too, you know, thinking about raising funds in a different way and what that means to the bottom line of the organization. Um, and taking more of an active role as advocates and giving advice and helping to adapt to the new reality. Know that the organizations are considering um, sort of how long it's going to take them to get up and running. And I think fortunately, we see the majority um, are, you know, less than a month, believe that they can turn the key and get back to where they were. Um, and are considering, you know, a whole host of variables from um, the CDC, the WHO, the willingness of participants or families to, to go on trips or send their children on trips, um, insurance, waivers, um, of course, the borders of Israel and whether they're going to be open and, and allowed, um, allowing entry, um, and the availability and speed of testing rate, all of these things that we, um, in a lot of ways, think about in our own lives, um, in our own plans, not just in the Israel travel sector, but certainly these are the, the key criteria. Um, and we know that these organizations are already pivoting and adapting to the new reality and focusing on virtual engagement. And however that, that their organization, whether it's uh, weekly policy briefings or online summer internships, um, as some examples, as you can see up here on the screen. So in terms of the Israel Travel Alliance, and I think Mike and Liz will get a little bit more into detail, I'll just say quickly that the group is currently in three branching into four working groups. Um, one focusing on communications, one focusing on retention and infrastructure of the sector, one that's working to uh, develop proposed policy recommendations and then interfacing with the government to address them, and then engagement of alumni as well as um, uh, future uh, participants. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, I think we're going to get to talking about the, um, the areas that Rena identified that the working groups are focused on throughout our discussion. But before we get to that, um, I want to ask Liz, Mike, and Stephen just to make a few comments from their perspectives on the work that they've um, embarked on through the ITA and also what they're sort of seeing within their own organizations. So Liz, do you want to start? Um... So first of all, thank you, Rena. It's been a pleasure, um, and I can speak on behalf of uh, Birthright Israel and the organizations that have been part of, as Ariel said, a really unprecedented uh, collaboration of these Israel education organizations. Um, I am thrilled to be a part of it, and you as the funders um, are hopefully very happy and proud um, that the organizations that so many of you are funding um, have been having this collaboration. Uh, the key areas that I've been working on with this group and that we have at Birthright Israel spending a lot of effort on is uh, retention of the infrastructure that is needed to return. Uh, that includes, but isn't limited to, um, our tour organizers, the tour operators, the people who provide and implement the program on the ground, uh, the tour education or tour guides, um, the majority of which are gig workers who are receiving no financial uh, support at all during this time of unemployment. This is what they do for a living uh, all year around. And um, if they are not employed this summer and potentially uh, next winter, there's grave concern over um, whether or not they will still even be in this business come um, next summer. They will not be able to survive a whole year um, without any type of employment. Many of them are already looking for other means of, of making money. And so a lot of concern um, there and what we do uh, with that, which I will speak a little bit about in a second. Um, staff training, collaborative possibilities, both for those tour educators. And when I say staff training, it's also retention and enrichment 
as well as staff training for the madrichim, the local staff who come from the communities that the participants come from and what collaborations we can have there. Looking at the young people who applied this summer who didn't end up going um, and how we work with them and how we retain their interest so that when we are ready to welcome them back, they're ready to come. And then of course, what needs to happen once they, um, once they return. So um, Rena didn't give you all the statistics of all the surveys um, that we did and all the information, but we have been looking at the economic sustainability of many of these um, trip organizers and tour operators, um, how many staff they have had to let go, they are keeping, those that are still alive, are, many are keeping just a minimum amount of staff in the meantime and have done layoffs um, and have obviously taken um, staff cuts. The tour educators, we at Birthright Israel have been really, really trying to work with them as much as possible, giving them opportunities right now for employment. So any of the virtual engagements that we are doing, both with our alumni and with the uh, young people who didn't come this summer, we have hired the tour educators themselves to do all those virtual um, opportunities. We pay them per day that they, um, that they are working. This can include reunions, uh, online reunions, reunions with the participants that they've had over the last uh, few years, reaching out to um, the potential participants doing virtual and experiential tours that we've been uh, videotaping and has interactive um, opportunities um, during any of the holidays that have come up, whether it was Yom Yerushalayim or now, you know, Tisha B'Av, anything having, um, hiring them to do the, that kind of work. With regards to the young people who applied this summer and didn't end up going, a lot of us are speaking together about how Birthright Israel may potentially partner with those organizations um, to bring them back for a shorter experience this coming, next coming summer. Um, once they are um, turning 18 as, as you know, pre-freshmen, some of the teen groups potentially. Um, and of course, a lot of work about what needs to happen in order to return. And Mike is gonna refer to a lot of the work that has to be done with the um, Israeli government um, we have been doing extensive scenario planning for when trips return, if COVID still exists, and what kind of logistical and educational and health and safety, first and foremost, um, items have to be considered. So just as a, you know, a small example to wrap your head around it, usually on our trips anyways, a group is 40 participants. We are not going to potentially be putting 40 participants on a bus together traveling. So that may be 20 participants. But the overhead cost for the bus is the same amount if you have 40 participants or 20 participants. And you need two tour guides or tour educators now. Instead of one for 40, you're going to need one for 20 because you're not traveling together. We usually put four in a room. Some groups put three in a room. Some groups put four in a room. Now we're talking about potentially one or two people in each room. Uh, food, not eating at buffets in hotels. So we've done a lot of analysis. Um, our estimates are for every 10 days per participant, we're talking about an additional $1,000 um, in additional costs. Um, so if your program was a 10-day program that costs $3,000, now it's going to be a 10-day program that costs $4,000 per participant. Um, we just completed a survey of participants, of our participants who didn't come uh, this summer. We're doing this once a month, so we will have another one that goes out in August. We got 1,084 uh, responses to the last survey that we um, put out, and the results were very, very fascinating. We asked a lot of questions about their current situation, about whether they're going back to school, et cetera, but also about their feelings about traveling to Israel. 18% of them, this was just in the United States, 18% um, said they would come now, 20% said they would come when cases decline, 26% said when there are no new cases, and 34% said only when there is a vaccine. Um, what was very interesting was that um, the most concerned group was not the 18 to 22 year olds, it was the 22 plus, the 22 to 26, and as the ages went up, the concern was greater. Um, 
And of everybody, which was also interesting, 34% said they wouldn't come without their parents' approval, which um, I found, you know, very, very interesting, I guess because their parents are all supporting them now and they're all back living at home um, and are dependent on their parents for their, uh, for their well-being. Um, so this is a little bit of the work that we are um, doing both um, just at Birthright and collaboratively with other organizations. We talk a lot about um, what, would it, what does and what should Israel education look like when we're not in Israel. And there are some amazing and very exciting initiatives that are happening um, the brain and creative power um, in that room um, is, is stupendous. But having said that, um, you know, the magic, um, the magic is the experience. It's the experience of connectedness. It's the experience of being Israel in Israel and really can't be duplicated anywhere but in Israel with Israelis. So as creative as we are all trying to be, we're also um, heartbroken and of course concerned about, like Rena said, the 80,000 participants that didn't come um, this summer, how do we all ensure that they get um, the Israel experience that I think is the birthright of every single young Jewish person. Okay, thank you, Liz. So for Honeymoon Israel, we look at Israel as an educational tool for engagement. So we look back on this moment uh, in time and go, and we were like, what are we going to do? Are we going to cancel? Are we not going to cancel? And that was a moment that uh, basically the idea of what today is the ITA came together because we all began uh, texting each other on WhatsApp. And from WhatsApp, it evolved into let's get together on a Zoom call um, because we all had no idea what to do. And the idea of the collective at that point became so powerful to hear that other groups were going to be canceling or postponing their trips um, gave me the ability to turn to my leadership, my board and say, you know, Birthright is postponing, everybody's postponing, we need to do the same thing. And it, it just gave us all, I think, a sense of great comfort to be in it together. Um, since then, we were a smaller organization, we've canceled so far, um, 18 groups that have been filled, um, an additional uh, nine groups that haven't gone yet. Um, our groups are 40 people. We put only put two people in a room for Honeymoon Israel. If there's four people in a room, we don't want to know. Um, but it, the, these are really times where we don't know what's going on. Um, to try to address that, we've formed uh, a working group that's led by Alon Wagner from Onward Israel to really understand and begin serious discussions with the government of Israel as to what are the policies going to be? Can we influence policy? Can we be part of the policy making? Um, can we have a point person? Um, and we're working with both Jaffe and JFNA um, as, as a working, small working committee in Israel to get answers. Um, right now, our point of, of people we're going to is the Ministry of Tourism has asked to be the point uh, organization within Israel. Israel is going through this whole change of a new government, of new people coming in. So it's been a bit of a balagan trying to um, understand who we need to talk to. But for now, we have a little working group in Israel. Uh, ben Perry from Momentum is there working with us. Jaffe, JFNA, uh, Ilan is there. Avi Rubel from Honeymoon Israel. Um, and we are trying to get um, our own uh, Tavsagul, purple kind of, our, our certificate of approval as to what 
kind of policies will allow um, groups to begin tourism. Um, Liz talked about who's willing to go back. Uh, right now, I don't think anybody's willing to go back, uh, and Israel's not willing to let us in um, for short-term uh, travel. Yesterday, the government of Israel approved long-term groups like Massa, educational programs, um, that those participants can come to Israel, they'll have the ability to quarantine, um, our, you know, nine day trips, you know, quarantining for even a day is really a challenge. So what are we trying to learn? Um, we're, we're trying to learn uh, about health, about uh, what kind of testing is going to happen, um, what does security look like? Liz talked about the size of the groups. What is the airport authority going to require? What's the prime minister's office looking at? Um, and can we get financial support from the government of Israel for those of us not currently receiving government support um, to help cover some of those expenses um, of smaller bus numbers, of additional health things? There's so much we don't know. So, um, we're working on it, and we're a long way from answers right now, is, is I think where we're at. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for, for having me, and thank you to JFM for hosting this, this panel. Um, I just have to, to also say a, a big thank you to Rena Goldberg and the team at JFNA, because there has been a lot of work behind the scenes and in coordinating this this large group of people not that it's a motley group but it, you know there's a lot of personalities in in this group of people and and they've done it with finesse and and with clear determination and with um a lot of uh kavod. so i i think they they deserve a lot of a lot of respect and a lot of accolades Listen, I, I'm going to make a, a plea in this moment in time that, you know, we're in a in fallow times and, and this is coming together. And my hope is that this kind of collaboration that the Israel Travel Alliance has has put together and has been really bottom up can be prevalent in times of plenty. Because I think that's that's one of those things when everyone has their different degrees and modicum of success. Um, there's much more of a tendency to be siloed and to work for your own um, for your own uh, advancement. And I think there's a real benefit in the all ships will rise mentality of coming together and collaborating in this moment and in moments in the future. Now, the the Jim Joseph found it. Before I even get into that, no one expected to be in this moment in time. No one expected to be um, speaking from our bedrooms, from our living rooms, from our fill in the blank. Some people have, that I've been on Zooms with have been speaking from their closets, like huddled away from the rest of their families, you know, with my ketubah in the background and um, just a, a new way of communicating. At the same time, I think it's really beneficial that you have people on this call from three different countries, from Israel, Canada, and the United States, um, four if you count San Francisco as a different country. And um, I, I think there's real tangible benefit for us to be able to come together like this and, and to have this degree of communication. Now, the Jim Joseph Foundation, which is a, a philanthropic foundation that's been around since 2006, the first major grant that was made by the Jim Joseph Foundation was to birthright Israel 14 years ago. Liz, you were still at birthright Israel at that point. And the Israel travel experience has been something that from even before that, that point, there's been an incredible amount of, of research and evaluation that's been put in by places like the Zold Institute, 
by the Cohen Center, by Rosov Consulting, by many others, and much more commissioned recently by Massa, by URJ, by the I Center, by the Jewish Education Project. All of this tells us that the, the immersive Israel travel experience leads to further enriched Jewish life and living. And the way that we look at it from the Jim Joseph Foundation perspective is we're looking to achieve connection, meaning, and purpose for young Jews. And at this moment in time, all of that has come to a halt. So we're trying to figure out what kinds of interventions can happen so that that sort of institutional knowledge and that real connection, that talkless connection is not lost. And you heard some of the examples in Rena's presentation, but there are examples like Onward Israel, which has internships that are generally six to 12 weeks where people are coming into Israel, having Jewish experiences and having internships are actually doing an online internship with, with Israel. We don't know yet what kind of substitute that is, but they're doing assessments on that. We have the interventions that Liz and Mike talked about for Birthright and Honeymoon Israel, respectively. You have the Hartman Institute has, has conducted a summer of learning. And there's all sorts of things that these organizations are doing to try to engage in different kinds of ways than they were before. And in some ways, these may be complementary even in the greatest of times. So I think you know, I've learned that, that R&D and, and real um, brainstorming happens in times where you're forced to make difficult decisions. But I think if we look at this as a time of real reckoning that can help how we're thinking about things in the future, I think we're going to be more, uh, we're just going to be in a more beneficial state. Um, and one last thing to, to just echo a point that Liz was making about the cost factor. I think we as, as funders and representatives of funders just need to, to realize that costs change over time. And that $3,000 mark that has been attached to the birthright experience has been in place, I believe, since 1999. And if we believe that that $3,000 is still accurate 21 years later, then we're sadly mistaken. So that $3,000 has already risen to around $3,600 or so by, by the budgets that they have. And so when we're looking at this, we need to just realize and recognize that costs, especially when they come to, to travel experiences, whether to Israel or elsewhere, will increase over time. And, and we representing funder organizations need to to really understand that when we're talking about our, the grant dollars that are within the Jewish world, we need to recognize that as we're recommending grant amounts. Thank you guys. I wanna make one other also quick comment on the cost factor and also um, I think the recruitment comment that Liz made, which is that there, there is a subset, as you heard from Rena, of organizations that are bringing non-Jewish participants to Israel. And, and mainly, I would say, with, the, with Honeymoon Israel as a big exception, which brings couples, some of whom are Jewish and some of whom are interfaith, um, many of the trips for non-Jews are for influentials. Um, and those trips have always been more expensive on a cost per person basis. I think those trips usually, depending on the organization and the size, average between five to seven or eight thousand dollars per person. Those costs also are less likely to be impacted and to go up to the same degree that Liz mentioned for birthright because they were never operating at the same economies of scale of having three people in a room um, and having um, 40 people on a bus. Some of those trips range from having, you know, seven people to maybe 25 people. So the tweaks that need to be made for those trips are actually more minor, but we should also keep in mind that those costs have always been higher as well. So I want to pivot. Stephen also sort of alluded to, to finding the opportunities in this moment, and I think one opportunity has been the, um, the chance to, for organizations to think more deeply about their alumni engagement. This is something that funders often are, I think, hammering home with their grantees as well, is 
um, thinking about the Israel experience as a really important experience, but just one tool in a spectrum of Israel engagement that includes engagement before and after the trip. And, um, you know, organizations often have a lot going on, and I think alumni engagement until this point was happening in, in very different ways and to varying degrees across the field. But in the absence of travel, I think everybody's been able to focus on it more seriously. And so Liz and Mike, uh, maybe we can start with you, Mike. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you've been learning about um, alumni engagement, what you've been experimenting with, and if, if you have any collaboration across the field, also if you're able to give a view just beyond Honeymoon as well, that would be great as well. We have always been about community building as an organization, as our core focus. So alumni engagement has been core at what Honeymoon Israel is all about. Um, but during these times, we can't do engagement in the same way that we previously have done it. Um, we've always been focused on how can we partner with other local community resources. We're in 20 some communities, um, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And at this time, we're, we're kind of at this point where we're trying to balance of not creating new things to simply create new things and fill time for staff and uh, experiment versus wanting to deeply and continue the engagement of people. Um, our, our board is saying, be careful, don't drift uh, in terms of mission and use this as a time to figure out how you can go deeper with the people. That would be something that will continue when, you, when we are in post-pandemic world God willing, sooner rather than later. Um, so we're looking at different new ideas, such as doing, um, and we've done a little of it, testing more retreats. We're doing um, online book clubs. Uh, we had Sarah Hurwitz the other day. Um, we're working right now with the Hartman Institute is looking at some online education programs that they can run for our alumni. Uh, we just ran a survey of all of our alumni, as well as separately all of those folks who are on the postponed trip, which represents about five, 600 people. Um, we had about 50% of the couples, one person in the couple responded to um, the survey. So we had of 23, 2400 um, alumni couples, we had about 11, 1200 of those couples respond. And just to understand what are the kinds of things they're looking for. Um, and, and what we heard is they want to replicate some of the things that made Honeymoon Israel, the trip in Israel, a meaningful experience. So Shabbat has become something, holidays, um, a, a community that supports each other. And so we are looking at the survey results and seeing how can we help those folks. Um, separately, the people from postponed trip haven't, they don't have a sense of community. Um, and so how do we help them in a different way uh, meet the needs of those folks who are, it, it, they're going because it's about Israel. Um, and so how do we bring Israel to them? And so we're, we're talking to folks at Vibe and other organizations that are doing virtual programming. We're right now, we're in conversations with uh, uh, Travel that does all of our groundwork in Israel about using our tour operators, our tour guides, our tour educators um, to provide meaningful beginning uh, touches of Israel to folks um, that will keep their interest up. I I'm, was blown away. We, we charge for Honeymoon Israel. Couples pay $2,500 uh, per couple for the experience. Um, 
when we said, would you like your money back? 90% uh, of them said, please hold on to our money. We are ready to go when you're ready to go, which was absolutely mind boggling. And the other 10% are people who are expecting a child and uh, won't be able to travel in the next year. Um, so I, I think it was a profound statement that they are looking, people so desperately um, are willing to hold on. They want this experience. Um, as Liz said, our results were very similar in terms of when people will be ready to go back. Some of our folks have children, so they're not going to be ready to jump on a bus um, as soon as people who don't have kids, who just uh, are, are not feeling uh, as compelled uh, in terms of their own personal safety. So, uh, Liz? Well, one of the things we found, and I think a lot of you are going to be very happy to hear this, because um, I know um, so many people ask birthright Israel, well, what about follow-up? What about what, when they came home? Why aren't you actually being the implementers of alumni engagement? So um, one of the amazing things that we have found is that a large, large, large percentage of our alumni are doing exactly what we hoped would happen when they come back from Birthright Israel, and that is becoming involved and engaged in other organizations. So when we reach out to alumni, we don't want to duplicate the programs that so many of them are saying. They're involved in Hillel. A lot of them, Hillel has been doing some magnificent, magnificent online programming um, this um, past uh, four months. And that is where the alumni who are on the Hillel, on campus-based trips, that is where we want them. We don't need to duplicate the huge investment the Jewish community is making in Hillel if Hillel is engaging those participants. Now, of course, that's not the be-all and end-all answer for every single participant. But our alumni that we are reaching out to um, are already doing programming with Hello, are doing programming with Moisha House, are doing programming with One Table, are doing the older ones, many of them who went on community-based trips through their federations, are involved in their young leadership at, um, at those local foundations. Not just involved, are in leadership positions on those, um, on those boards as a result of the birthright community trips that they went on and they're engaging. So that takes care of a really, really significant percentage of the, um, of the population. Then what we're finding is some to send out, um, whether through social media or emails, inviting people to online opportunities. Certainly during March and April and even into May, there was huge uh, response for that. That slows down after a while. There is Zoom fatigue. What we're finding is if there's a personal connection between the person who is inviting them and they know that person, that is making a difference. So what we've done now is we're engaging our uh, Birthright Israel Fellows. Our fellows are an elite staff training opportunity for local madrasim in, in North America. And some of them, A, are Jewish professionals by profession. About 60% of our Birthright Israel Fellows work in the Jewish community. So they are by part of the work that they are doing engaging those. And others are just amazing, amazing um, experiential Jewish educators on their own that are doing some fantastic things um, and inviting the participants who were on their groups who they had this 10 day um, immersive experience with. And when you're invited by the person who you looked up to, who was a mentor to you, who was inspirational to you, who you know and you trust, um, that's working out great. And the same goes with the tour educators. So when the invite comes from a tour educator to the people who were on their group, or from the Birthright Israel Fellow, who their participants who were on their group, the invitation is coming from them, that is working out really, really, really well. So um, we, we have tapered our initiatives depending on the time. Like I said at the beginning, there was a lot. Now the Zoom fatigue is, is huge um, and we have to be creative um, in, in how we do it. I would love to see um, as part of, you know, and Stephen talked about 
the collaboration, um, the amazing collaboration of these organizations and the ITA. Um, I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of a, not that we need another Jewish organization with another acronym, um, but I think this one is Kadai. I really, really, really do. And whether this becomes, you know, a subsection of JPRO um, as, a, as a group within and of itself or something under JFNA, I'm not sure what the future is going to hold or eventually there's going to be people hired um, to do this or we keep it organic. Um, but concierging each other's participants into each other's organizations in the Jewish world and not duplicating service and not asking you the funders because we think we have a better idea than another organization who's already doing a fantastic job. The investment should be made in how do we make those partnerships? How do we concierge people from one program to another program? You know, we at Birthright work very closely with Onward Israel and with Massa to ensure that when the kids come back from Birthright, they know about Onward and then they know. Those are the types of things that we need to not happen haphazardly, but we need to, as a community who cares so much about Israel education, uh, start being much more strategic about. That was a great segue actually to my next question. So thank you, Liz. Um, before I ask the question, I just want to remind people that if you have questions that you want us to get to, you can put them in the Q&A or in the chat um, as we're talking and I'm keeping tabs on those. So feel free to do that at any time. I wanted to actually pivot away a little bit from the travel experience and the, um, and the engagement of folks who are meant to be traveling to Israel at this time or alumni to more broadly the question of Israel education. I think many of us, and this includes funders in this field, have sort of put Israel travel at the pinnacle of Israel education. Um, and the question now has really emerged strongly is what does Israel education look like and mean in the absence of travel? Um, where are there strengths in this field? Where are there gaps that we've identified? Where can there be more synergies between the organizations that are running trips and the organizations that are doing Israel education, which have sort of been two separate but related fields right now? So maybe Stephen, um, I wonder if you can chime in a little bit on this based on your work with a number of organizations in these fields. Sure, and thank you for the questions. I'm I'm overjoyed that I'm I'm not having to chime in that much because there's so much expertise on this call that it allows me to stay quiet for a lot of it. Um, I uh, no, I, I appreciate the the question. I think in terms of of Israel travel, I'm just going to make um, a friendly amendment to the the description of it as an immersive Israel experience because travel connotes something that I think is a little bit different than these experiences actually are. Um, I think this is a big question. What, what happens now? I think for many organizations, and I've talked to Liz exten extensively, I've talked to Alon Wagner extensively, and we've talked to, to Avi and Mike extensively about how many of the people who had been signed up are already on wait lists for, for the subsequent opportunity to travel, and there's going to be provisions to allow them to travel at a later time. But it doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be some sort of extensive Israel education and learning opportunity in the interim. And I think that's where some of these interventions that, that Mike and Liz and Rena have been talking about come in. And I think there's, there's more to say. And one other opportunity along those lines, and I had this conversation with Abby Dalber Stern, who runs um, Makom, which is part of the Jewish agency, is that you have people from around the world that can connect at this point, at this moment in time through video conferencing, Zoom, Teams, what have you. And you can have that direct Mifgash experience, if not in person. Um, and you can also have connections between Israeli Americans and, um, and American participants in local communities in different kinds of ways that continue on that Israel education. I also think that, you know, looking back at the list of 37 that Rena showed, it's a really important piece that the I Center and the Jewish Education Project and others that serve as umbrellas in the educational space are, are part of this coalition because they're collectively thinking about how to infuse that, that through line into everything that's happening right now. 
And I think without that, you're, you're just talking about, you know, the, the travel component and you're not talking about the, the real experience. Um, I can say on a personal note, my, my parents uh, just went on a, a four day virtual Israel tour through JNF, uh, you know, a week and a half ago that was facilitated by one of the educators at Alexander Musk High School in Israel. And they said it was fantastic. Now, my parents met in Israel. They've been, you know, at least a dozen times. They sent both of their, their sons on year course. They, you know, have a strong Zionist um, connection and a, a, a huge experience, amount of experience over there. But this experience for them was unique and they got to explore different places that they had never seen before. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity in this moment in time um, if we allow the practitioners to, to think broadly and to, to do things a little differently in, uh, than they may have been doing over the last several years. Um, I have a couple questions left and maybe I'll ask both of them and then you guys can sort of choose which one you want to you want to talk about. One is since this is a JFN call we've touched on the role of philanthropy here but let me ask that question specifically and I would ask Mike and Liz um, from your perspective of your organizations but also your work in the ITA and seeing needs across the field. Are there areas in which uh, funders can be helpful to you or to the field? That's one question I want to ask. And then the sort of related question is just about the, the ITA, which seems like it's been so successful in bringing these organizations together in a somewhat, I think, unprecedented way. Um, are there lessons that we can share here across the broader Jewish community? Can this be a model for other sectors? How do we keep this going? It sort of came as a necessity out of the reality that we're in, but how do we keep up this kind of collaboration and communication in the field going forward? I, I'll jump in and say part of the uh, this whole thing of the ITA actually came as a result of a number of funders pulling, and you were part of it, Ariella, pulling together in February a group of us involved in Israel uh, education, Israel tourism, um, and building upon that, that that really I think the funders help set the tone. Uh, I, I think there's been a huge shift. I think the ITA is something that has to continue in some way, shape, or form, uh, because I think there's so much we can learn. And working together post-pandemic is going to be, I think, a significant uh, plus one for the, the Jewish people. Um, I think it's a model that I know JFNA is leading a group of uh, organizations doing engagement and Honeymoon Israel is involved uh, in that part of the, the work. Um, we want to thank, I think, the, the funding world, Jewish funding world came to us immediately and said, we have your back. And those words in the first few weeks of the pandemic um, allowed me to sleep a little bit at night. And I think our team, the, the entire staff, um, thought they were all going to lose their jobs. And the fact that the, the, the JFN group of funders came to us and said, we have your back. Um, don't worry, we'll get through this together, was the most valuable, important thing um, for the survival. Now, many of the, the funders uh, have asked the question, uh, who shall live and who shall die? And, is, and that may be a healthy thing. So I think the whole question coming out of this is, is there going to be consolidation? How should that happen um, in a smart way, not in a panic-driven way that strengthens us rather than takes away from us? If I can jump in, Ariel, and, and just um, express my appreciation for uh, what my panelists have said thus far, um, and their very kind words in talking about the ITA. Um, for me, it's been really um, 
partnering and validating, hearing the feedback from the from the programs themselves. Of course, you're hearing Liz and Mike here, but we've got you know 35 other organizations, and they are all expressing really just um, you know just such um, comfort in being with one another, um, and and really feeling for the first time, as 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 Ariel you said, um, this happening has brought really great optimism even through this very challenging time. And to me, the example I always, you know, consider um, as a great outcome, and Liz alluded to this, but when the working groups first broke out into little groups, um, two of them came back with the same sort of idea, which is the beautiful idea of how do we share information so that no kind of participant gets left behind? How do we ensure that there's a continuum um, and a relationship between the, the programs so that um, the core goal for everyone, um, and I should say for federations too, right? Um, federations are supporting not only the organizations themselves, but supporting members of their communities to go on these trips, to go on teen tours, eighth grade school programs, all the way up to birthright, of course, you know, unique partnerships with um, Honeymoon Israel, with um, Momentum, etc. This is really a part of our lifeblood in the North American Jewish community, um, not, which is not to say that, of course, these entities also have global reach, right? We're not even just talking just about our own Jewish community in North America, but think about the peoplehood aspect um, of, of some of these global organizations of Birthrate and Massa and Momentum, who touching over 70 countries and communities around the world. Um, so I think that, that to me at the core of sort of the hope that the work of the ITA is going to continue in some capacity um, and the willingness of all of its members to really pitch in and, and be there together. Great, Rena, thank you. Thanks to everybody. I just want to chime back in here right at, since we're at the end of the hour. Uh, thanks to everybody for a great conversation. Of course, we're happy to continue, uh, go deeper. We can schedule another call uh, for any any deeper issues. Uh, anybody you know who'd like to ask some further questions, feel free to email me at david at jfunders.org and we can pass it along to everybody. Or uh, of course, I'm sure most of you are already in touch with, with most of our panel. So thanks again to Rena, Mike, Liz, Stephen, and Ariella for leading this and take care, keep in touch and we will we will talk soon.